Today we'll be talking about uh, inflation and not the economic kind, where it looks like things get more expensive, but an early phase in the universe, which was very strange and might explain some very interesting questions that have come up about uh, the universe as a whole. So first, I will relate to you that I am the person that says here, Robert Nemiroff, and this is Michigan Technological University. And um, this is a, you stumbled upon this class somehow in some list of links, either on iTunes or on the web, but you're welcome here. Please keep watching. This is fun, particularly if you're interested in cool concepts, because we're going to uh, go through lots of cool concepts in this class uh, with as little math as possible. All right. So Einstein created general relativity, and out of that, people came up with the idea of the Big Bang and uh, cosmology, uh, relativistic cosmology. Uh, but uh, it was realized that there were some problems that were unsettling. Uh, not just Olber's paradox, which is seemingly uh, in another lecture uh, solved, but uh, at least three problems were commonly discussed. One is the uh, horizon problem. So uh, it wasn't clear. It seems that if you look in one direction, you see um, matter that's like something, and if you look in the other direction, matter is very much the same. Uh, moreover, if you look at the microwave background, which we will get to in another uh, which came out of the early universe, uh, it has the same temperature pretty much close in one direction as it does 180 degrees on the sky. So if you're here in some universe, call it our universe, and here's the microwave background here, so you look in this direction, you say, oh, oh, I understand, it's about 2.7 kelvins in that direction. Oh, let's look in this direction. Oh, it's 2.7 kelvins. But how could they know about each other? they seem to be, have been in thermal contact or something in the past to have the same temperature. How is that? So that's called the horizon problem. Uh, there's also the flatness problem. So over the past hundred years, people have continually estimated how dense the universe is compared to how dense it would need to be to be Euclidean, Euclidean flat. Euclidean, I can say that. Um, so we'll get to that in other lectures. but. Uh, uh, various determinations never had that we were 0. 0.0001 or less or a thousand or more uh, of this density that's needed to make space flat, but we were close to it. Close meaning some estimates were 20% of the density, 0. 0.2. Uh, sometimes people thought, oh, look, we're consistent with one. Um, even though we can't account for it in the current matter. So this flatness problem is how come it's so close to this universal density that's, um, but not exactly that. Um, and the last is that many theories of the early universe involving particle theories have exotic relics that are made by very powerful collisions. So when you have powerful collisions as you might have, much more powerful than say could be created at Fermilab or Brookhaven or a uh, Large Hadron Collider, you would get things that are made that would hang around. And you might get a lot of them, but we don't see a lot of them. For instance, uh, the magnetic, magnetic monopole is an interesting one, usually is the poster child for this kind of uh, problem. So that's why it's called the magnetic uh, monopole problem, but it occurs with other particles. Um, that, um, okay, so if you ever have a magnet, you might notice that there's always a north, and it attracts one type of magnet, and south, which repels that same type. So if you have a, another magnet south, it wants to attract the south to the north. And then again, you have north at the top and south, if you were to put these two together. So uh, why don't you just cut off the south? That's what you do. And then you just have a south thing. Right? So then if you look at that thing you just cut out, and you're so proud of yourself, you have uh, indeed south of the bottom, but then you notice that the top is north again. So that didn't work. So maybe you just weren't paying attention last time. You didn't do it right, or whoever did it didn't do it right, so now you're going to have to do it yourself. So you cut it again in half, and every time you cut it in, you find out that there's a north pole and a south pole. So then you have to blame something else. So you have to blame the magnetic monopole problem and say it's a due to our inflating universe or something. It's not your fault. Um, so the magnetic monopole problem says that there are magnetic monopoles. You can get a north or a south. And in fact, it's needed in particle physics to create things like quantization, which we won't get into in the details right now. But we, you wouldn't get a lot of them. Why isn't there a lot of them? That's the problem. You should have lots of these around, and you don't. 
and inflation is going to try to give us a single solution that would involve all three of these. Um, first, let's do a little background and say that uh, in 50 years ago or so, there were thought to be four fundamental forces in the universe. Gravity, which holds us to our, our planet that we're so proud of. Electromagnetism, which uh, not only does electricity, but um, see, electric charge, you can have just monopoles. You can have a positive electric charge and a negative electric charge, and you can even have a dipole charge, but with magnet, magnetism, you only get two. You don't get the monopoles. Uh, but they're all combined by James Clerk Maxwell, uh, in the late 1800s to electromagnetism, which includes photons, so that's now considered to be a force. So electri electric force and magnetic force are no longer considered to be different. Uh, but things in the nucleus, things that hold the nucleus together and keep it from um, exploding, the strong nuclear force, and a more subtle one, which is figured out as the weak nuclear force. It's actually kind of interesting to read about that one. So um, Steven Weinberg and collaborators uh, figured out that the, elect the weak nuclear force could actually be the same as the electromagnetic force and would look the same at high enough energies, and so you can combine those into something called the electroweak force. So one of the pushes in modern physics is to say, well, hey, this strong nuclear force isn't involved in that yet. So let's come up with a mathematical framework, sometimes involving multiple dimensions, uh, that um, called a grand unified theory that includes all of these. Uh, but the grand unified theories are usually not so bold as to include, include gravity, which is stranger yet, uh, the weakest force. And so in order to include those, the, the latest theories are in super string theories, sometimes called just string theories, or M theories, there's different names for them. So these are not yet um, complete theories. We don't have a, well, the electric force, electro weak one is, but below that we're not exactly sure of the details. Uh, however, if you go further back in the universe, energy becomes so abundant and things smash into each other so much that forces become indistinguishable. So, for instance, if you go to uh, relatively high energies, uh, which occurred at 10 to the minus 12 seconds after the Big Bang, you would find the electromagnetic force and the weak force would become one and the same. Uh, if you go earlier back, which means that there's no distinguishing between them. They just, things bounce into each other, so there's particles like that. There's no the same type of things would hold, carry both of them. Uh, the strong force, even though we don't know uh, a detailed grand unified theory that uh, completely works, would be matched with the electroweak uh, theory at around 10 to the minus 35 seconds when the temperature was, oh, about in 10 to the 20 something here. 10 to the 20, let's call it 8. I'm happy with 8. Um, so then, all of those forces and the carriers of those forces seem to merge. And then you don't get to include gravity really until you get back to the Planck time, which we went and talked about in another lecture. Please give Planck his C. Uh, Planck time, uh, which was uh, very high, 10 to the 32 uh, Kelvins, and this is a unit of energy, 10 to the 19 GeV. At that time, we lose general relativity because it doesn't seem to work at those energies, and it me meshes in we need a quantum field theory that involves gravity that could be one of the string theories that are being debated today. Okay, so uh, to combat the three problems before, the horizon problem, the uh, monopole problem, and the problem which I forgot called the flatness problem, uh, inflation was one solution and is usually the preferred solution uh, these days. So what happens is the universe goes into a phase, there's a phase shift. So as things change, for instance, as ice freezes, you might notice a phase change. So when water freezes into ice, it changes into a solid. So when the universe cools, um, so for instance, got started on the other end. So the universe was um, very hot, right, and it was water. And then it, at the, as the water cools in your freezer, it forms ice. As the universe cooled, strange things happen. Phase changes like ice happened in the universe as things froze out. Uh, one type of phase change thought to happen when the, at the electroweak interaction, when electroweak breaks off from, weak breaks off from electromagnetism is, and possibly at other times, but possibly at that time, which would be the latest one, the universe would suddenly begin to expand exponentially. There would be a type of dark energy there, and uh, you would create a, what would seem to be a cosmological constant that would operate for a short amount of time, and has been discussed uh, in another lecture. Uh, so uh, then the universe will become 
very, very large. Instead of just sort of drifting apart with gravity sort of holding it back a little bit, it now has gravity pushing it apart and it inflates exponentially. So things that used to be close together then become very far apart. And the way that helps the horizon problem is that now, well, at least for the past couple billion years, we've been catching back up to the stuff that's been pushed apart. So it answers the horizon problem by saying, well, things used to be close together, and then they were pushed apart by inflation, or not only pushed apart, but when inflation ended, a whole bunch of particles were created all over the universe that had the same temperature. Um, why inflation ends uh, is related to what's called a driving field. The simplest kind of field used is something called a scalar field, because it only has one number in every space, place in space-time. Um, but uh, it's really unknown. But they do, it, what is known is that inflation has to go on for a certain amount of time or you won't solve those problems. You won't dilute the number of monopoles down to maybe one in our horizon, which we would be extremely lucky to find. You won't uh, create different parts of the universe that would have relatively the same temperature as is the, in the horizon problem. And when inflation operates, it's like you can think of inflation sort of as the surface of a balloon. So a balloon would have a lot of curvature, as you can tell by the... Um, the window drawn on there showing reflected. Uh, but as you make the balloon uh, really, really big, bigger and bigger, essentially the balloon flattens out. A surface on the balloon becomes, appears to be flatter and flatter. And that's what the flatness problem does. The universe may or may not be slightly greater than closure density, the complete flatness. It might be slightly unflat in any number of ways, but it's so close to flat, it's like the room you're sitting in the floor is flat to a good approximation. You don't have to worry about the curvature of the Earth when considering the floor beneath you. Okay, so you can get a timeline of the early universe, so when did things happen? This is a repeat of another uh, slide, another lecture. But uh, 10 to the minus 43 seconds, you're at the Planck scale, and some theory of everything is operating and the temperature is very high. So then, at some point, around 10 to the minus 37 seconds, it's estimated the, um, there's a phase transition, the strong nuclear force freezes out, and you might have an uh, inflationary epoch. Uh, and then at 10 to the minus 35 seconds, um, you would get uh, the inflation would end, particles are created everywhere in the universe, and the universe is then so large, much larger than before, that everything is cool. So we only see a small part of our universe here, in the visible universe. Uh, if inflation is correct, which it appears to be, then the universe is much, much larger than the small amount that we can see. So right now, you can only look around your room. Uh, but there's a lot of big Earth out there, and if you look at enough Earth, there's curvature. So right now, uh, the universe uh, might appear to us to be flat in our very small space in our visible universe that we can see. Okay, so here's a graph which shows the rate of the universe greatly increased in a small amount of time. And I'm running low on time, so I have to go fast. Please forgive me. Here's a nice plot which I keep getting to. Uh, created by the WMAP team, but I'm not able to explain ever in much details. Here you see inflation happens down here, and here are the different phases of the universe that were covered in another lecture, uh, coming to today over here. Okay, um, oh, this is the last slide. So some people think that uh, the inflationary epoch that we're in is a lot like the dark energy epoch that we're entering now. So we may be entering into another dark, dark energy phase, and the universe is beginning to expand again exponentially. Today. And it will take billions of years to fully realize this exponential. We don't know if it will end, if ever. Uh, that'll be a topic for a different lecture. However, it could be related to uh, something called the Casimir effect, which is seen in things as small as mayonnaise, and it causes micro-mechanical me parts to stick together. Because uh, this is sort of a, uh, a field effect, where some field nodes uh, map out and aren't seen, the Casimir effect. And uh, there could be something similar operating in dark energy and empty space. And with that, I will leave you to next lecture. I'll see you next time. Bye.